I apologies. Uh, I, I I couldn't make the trip because of some mishap. But anyway, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, um, it's great that I'm following uh, Chimiao and Jen's talk because my my talk will take off from what they said. Uh, I'll fill in a few more details, and then segue to. Um, to, to what's called the Berry curvature. And this is a highly mathematical uh, object, but I'll try to anchor it um, in, in experiment. I try, try to make it obvious what, what, what exactly uh, does that mean? This notion, which actually is very old, has caused a, a, a revision of what, how, how we think about crystals. And then eventually I'll talk about recent experiments that um, make use of this uh, new concept. Okay, uh, let, let, me, let me start. So uh, uh, Jen has actually covered a lot of the material here, uh, which makes my job somewhat easier. And so I will, where, where possible, I will make contact with what she said. Now let me just turn these things off. Okay, so as you know, uh, crystals can come of, of metals can come in many forms, and they can be very complicated, right? So, uh, what physicists like to do is to make things as simple as possible, and uh, so it's the the simplest case is a square lattice. Uh, so, as Jen mentioned, this could be monolayer graphene, except graphene has a hexagonal structure. But many of the same notions apply. Now, we, we call each of these points the one-year state, one-year site, sorry. And if you now, so you would put an atom on each site. And then if you add the wave function that surround uh, each atom, you get a cartoon that looks like this, right? So where the, the, the cotton ball is the probability cloud of the electron, it can be found uh, anywhere around, uh, you know, as indicated by this uh, gray ball, with uh, black indicating highest probability of it being found there, and then it tapers off before it runs into the neighbor. Now, uh, as uh, Chimiao already mentioned, uh, there are a lot of electrons, even in the smallest uh, speck of uh, uh, metal. So gold, a millimeter cube size uh, sample, will have 10 to the 20 electrons. So, so th this is a number beyond human comprehension, uh, but that's our task. So the challenge for us, uh, how, how do you describe the quantum behavior of 10 to the 23 electrons, right? And does this question have any meaning? You know, why would you want to do that? And how would you convey the information on so many electrons? And on top of it, you, you want the quantum behavior. So the trick that physicists uh, use and, and others uh, is to focus on the op occupancy of quantum states, which is indicated by this uh, notation, but I won't be using it. Oh, uh, everything I say will, will have minimal use of mathematical equations, and I'll try to represent the concepts by pictures as far as I can. Eventually I will fail uh, <laughs> because this is a very quantum mechanical subject, but okay, let's see, Let, let's see. Uh, and I invite questions. Now the, the analogy that best describes how a physicist looks at a chunk of metal is uh, imagine a hotel with many floors, right? The, the number of floors could be a billion. Uh, and you focus not on the guests, who are all identical, right? These are electrons, but rather on the occupancy of individual rooms. Okay, so in this cartoon, the uh, the floors uh, rapidly expand in a number of rooms as you go up, uh, but you make sure that the occupancy is restricted to only two guests, and they come spin up and spin down. Um, you could also have single occupancy, of course. Uh, there are no elevators, that's the key point. So as guests stream in, 
they preferentially like to occupy the lowest floors, right? And I think this is not a surprising uh, statement. Uh, the, the floor that has exactly half occupancy, in other words, every other room is empty, is what we call the family level, right? And uh, the spread of the partially occupied floors, here it, it's about three, is determined by the absolute temperature. Right, so at T going to zero, which is the temperature that we all love to work at, uh, there's only one floor that has partial occupancy. But as you heat up the, the chunk of metal, the, the uh, floors that are partially occupied will spread up. Okay, now you need a way to locate the room. Uh, let's say you are the floor manager, and as guests come in, you have to assign them to a room. So you need a way to rapidly identify the occupancy, right? So a room is uh, identified by the quantum state, and these are numbers that Jen already mentioned. Um, and so you have a floor plan. Okay, this floor plan is fundamental to our field, and it's called K-space, right? And I'll, I'll describe everything now about what K-space is, uh, what does it do, and why it's useful. As mentioned, the occupancy is restricted to two electrons, and this is called Fermi statistics. And already mentioned, the Fermi level is the floor that is exactly half empty. Okay, I already mentioned the role of temperature. Okay. Uh, now, Che Miao already mentioned the wave function as the gen, right? So here, here's a particular series of cartoons that show you what wave functions are and how from the wave functions we identify the quantum number, which is also called the wave vector, that actually identifies a particular state, in other words, a room in this hotel uh, uh, that the wave function is referring to. So um, you have a million atoms, right, each harboring a specific atomic wave function or atomic state. What a block wave function is, that's the trade name, is uh, you, you multiply the, the combination of these atomic wave functions by an envelope wave function, shown in blue. And what it does, it, it tells you how to mix up these uh, uh, atomic states. So I've shown here, uh, you know, this is small because the envelope is weak. Here it's a maximum, right, because the envelope peaks. Here it's almost zero because the envelope is crossing zero. And then if you have sharp eyes, you notice that this has exactly, it's the image, it's the negative image of this, it's inverted. Well, because the envelope tells it to do so, right? So imagine all these waves, and you all know from waves that you can identify the wavelength, which I've drawn here. The half the wavelength is the distance between nodes. Now the wavelength uh, is usually expressed as the wave vector. Oh, I have an error here, sorry. So this should be lambda, right? So if you know the wavelength, you take its reciprocal multiplied by two pi, and you get what's called the wave vector. So uh, the direction of the wave propagation is given by this uh, wave vector, but we will also use the wave vector, which is actually comprised of two numbers, right? The X and Y direction of the propagation as the quantum numbers that identify the room in this hotel. All right, so what, what's the hotel? Uh, uh, it's the floor plan plotted in KX and KY. And this plot is pixelated, right? So imagine that it's covered by these tiny dense points. Uh, maybe there are a billion of them. And each one of them represents a room in this hotel that I mentioned. Okay, so think of the pixel as the particular room and it can either be occupied or not. Now it turns out that uh, as you as you decrease the wavelength, right here I've shown the two pictures here, the energy of this wave function increases, right? 
which means that as k increases in this direction, uh, you increase the energy associated with the state. So from this, you would infer that the state close to the origin is minimal, right? And it increases as you move away from the origin, it just grows. And I'll show you a sketch of this growth in the next slide. Now, um, a very important point is this notion of Bragg plane. So you can't keep going, right? You cannot keep shrinking the wavelength uh, because beyond a certain point, uh, it becomes undefined, right? You cannot wiggle the atoms, uh, the wave functions at a, at a rate more rapid than the spacing between neighbors. So this is called the Bragg limit or the Bragg plane. So only the uh, wave vectors smaller than the Bragg plane, so to speak, or, or in case within the Bragg planes uh, are allowed. Okay, so uh, this is called the Brewan zone, which Jen briefly mentioned. Hopefully, uh, this, this is a busy slide, but hopefully the, the pictures uh, convey the, the meaning that I, 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 I wanted to convey. All right, so this is showing what I said in a more, uh, in a higher perspective. So let, let me repeat here. So you are the floor manager and you have to assign rooms to huge number of guests that are pouring in. So you look at your floor plan and this is your floor plan, right? So uh, as things stand right now, all the rooms that are low in energy, remember the energy increases as you move along, uh, uh, to higher K, these are all occupied, right? So that corresponds to all these rooms here. And therefore you, you have to put new guests at, on higher floors. Now to show the connection even more clearly, I'm now plotting in on the axis perpendicular to the screen, right? Uh, the energy, so as I mentioned, as you move away from the origin, the energy increases. And more often than not, it increases uh, quadratically, right, as indicated by this expression. So uh, clearly you want to first uh, put all the guests, all the electrons in the lowest uh, energy states, which pop out at the Fermi level, right? And then all further states are higher in energy and they will be unoccupied. So I think now it's clear uh, uh, this circle encloses all the occupied states and the vacant states are on the uh, unshaded areas. As mentioned, um, this energy level is called the Fermi level, a quantity that uh, uh, is very important for, for folks who look at the physics of metals. And in the K space, uh, it's shape. Here it's a circle. It's called the Fermi surface. Now, the, the advantage of talking about K space is that the only electrons that you are interested in are the ones that occupy the Fermi level. So out of the 10 to the 23 electrons, you are only interested in the electrons that are occupying the highest level. So back to the hotel analogy, uh, you see that it's only these electrons that can shuffle from room to room, right? The ones that are deep on the occupied floors are basically stuck. They're, they're locked to their rooms because the neighboring ones are all occupied. So you have, you have reduced the problem significantly uh, from 10 to the 23 to maybe 10 to the 12. Okay, now knowing, knowing this picture, uh, I have to introduce a few notions, um, in particular the velocity. So the velocity of the electron in a crystal is actually the rate at which the energy increases, right? You can see that uh, the rate is increasing very slowly here. In fact, the velocity is zero. Here it's uh, 
increasing rapidly as you move out in K, and here even more so. So mathematically, uh, this is written, uh, although I, I won't be needing the actual expression, as some kind of derivative, right? You, 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 the rate of change of a quantity V, uh, E, relative to changes in K, gives you the velocity. But I'll often show this symbol, and you can take this symbol to mean this notion of increase of the energy. So here, here's where I touch base with what Jen mentioned. Uh, this is a cross section, the, the red curve of the bowl, right? And you, you find that uh, it increases, the velocity is a maximum near the uh, midpoint of this energy. But ultimately, when you hit the Bragg plane, which is the maximum rate of oscillation of the wave vector, it, it has to go to zero, the, the slope has to go to zero. So the velocity has to vanish both at the minimum and at the maximum. Uh, but aside from this special behavior, this is actually quite analogous to our ordinary uh, free particle in the vacuum. Now, again, to touch base with what Jen said, uh, this is a slightly different way to look at it, but it's really saying the same thing. There is a gap, uh, as uh, you know, in, in the previous example, as we increase the energy, it tops out when it hits the Bragg plane, uh, that defines a band, right? The, the minimum and the maximum define an energy band, uh, which was already referred to. And then it, you, you go on to the next band and yet the next one. Uh, if the bands don't overlap, Right, this would be the example where you don't have the spaghetti uh, mixed that Jen mentioned. Then you, you have the possibility of having an insulator. Right? When, whenever the Fermi energy uh, doesn't end up in the gap, then you have a metal, as I've shown here. But if you were unfortunate enough to have the Fermi energy be inside the gap, then you have an insulator. And I think a, a clear way to understand, uh, an easy way to understand the distinction is to imagine this portal having no floors after, after a number, right? So there's, there's a, maybe three or four, four levels that are empty of rooms and that it continues thereafter. That would represent an energy gap. So once all the guests fill the lower levels, it's very hard for them to climb to the next uh, band, right? They, they need significant amount of energy. And if you apply an electric field, which is uh, equivalent to tilting the floors, then you see the electrons don't roll. They, they can't roll down to the lower energy levels because all the neighboring rooms are occupied. By contrast, if you didn't have this gap, then when you tilt the floor slightly, you see electrons can now jump from one room to the next. And that constitutes a, an electric current. Now, the discovery of this gap was transformational. Uh, I think it was Felix Bloch. Um, before his work, it was a big mystery. Why, why the resistivities, uh, which measures the difficulty of conveying current, differs by 10 to the 12th, right, which is a, a billion times uh, between all kinds of elements. And this was a deep puzzle, right? But uh, Bloch's idea of this energy gap essentially solved this problem. And, and that led to the invention of the transistor, which is really equivalent to invention of the wheel with respect to modern civilization. Everything we do now, including the iPhone, would not have happened without the invention of the transistor, and that was based on the understanding of the energy gap. Okay, uh, before I talk about the new aspect of this uh, uh, picture, uh, I need to remind you what a magnetic field is, and I'm, I'm sure all of you know this, but this is just a reminder. 
if you have a magnetic field uh, indicated by these uh, arrows, and you have a particle, let's say a positive charge particle, moving at a velocity, it, it will experience what's called a Lorentz force. And the Lorentz force is the multiple, the cross products of V and B. This is a fancy way of saying that the force has to be perpendicular to the velocity and the magnetic field. So it, it points horizontally into the page, right? And as a result, it compels the charge to move in a circle. Uh, I think Jen referred to this already. We call this a cyclotron orbit. And if this were a positive charge, it would circulate as shown. If it were negative, it would circulate in the opposite direction. And this is very important for the experiment I want to talk about uh, in a few slides uh, from now. Uh, I debated about whether I should talk about this vector potential A, but let, let me go ahead and run it by you because I will need to refer to it uh, in, in one slide. Now you can represent the magnetic field in two ways. You can either talk about it itself, but physicists like to refer to what's called the vector potential A, uh, which sort of defines the circulation that corresponds to the charge particle, right? For a charge, for the, the circulation uh, here, it goes in the opposite sense as the cyclotron orbit of the particle. But anyway, the, the curl, which is a, again, a derivative of this uh, circulating field, gives you the magnetic field. So ordinarily, you wouldn't need to talk about A, but for my purpose, I need to refer to it. But anyway, these are equivalent and alternate descriptions of the same magnetic field. And uh, so finally, uh, the capstone of all this, uh, all, all these uh, advances is what's called the semi-classical equations of motion, right? So in order for you to, predict the behavior of electrons uh, in a solid, you usually want to apply electric fields and magnetic fields. And theorists uh, derive these two equations, which we won't need to analyze, luckily, right? Uh, but I just wanted to show you what the new step is. Now, imagine the, you're talking about electrons moving in the presence of 10 to the 23 atoms. So it's surprising that the equations of motion are very simple. In fact, this, this was a, a huge uh, accomplishment in the early 50s and 60s. Uh, Walter Cohn, who has already been mentioned by Jen, I think, called this a, 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 a very simple result that was uh, shockingly <laughs> difficult to derive. If you look at this paper, it took about 20 papers of dense calculation, but at the end of the day, it's simple. And, and this is particularly so when you compare it with what you expect for a free electron, right? Uh, I, think, I think most of you will, will remember this. If I have a free electron in vacuum, exposed to an electro, uh, electric field and a magnetic field, the electric field itself will accelerate and cause a a change in the momentum, right? But the magnetic field will exert the Lorentz force, which I already explained, and that would cause the, the momentum to change, but in a circular fashion. And that gives rise to the cyclotron orbit that I mentioned. Furthermore, it goes without saying that you remember for free electron, the velocity of the electron is simply the momentum divided by the mass. Now, these two equations have a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? You, you can think of the K dot here multiplied by the Planck constant as basically the momentum uh, uh, derivative and the velocity, well, it's, it's a bit more uh, complicated, uh, but it technically looks nearly identical to the velocity for free particle, except for the caveat I mentioned before, at the minimum of the energy band and at the break point, the velocity can vanish. But that's the only important exception. By and large, these two equations say the same thing. And um, when I was a, 
an undergraduate, when I first learned about this, it was a profound disappointment because I was expecting, wow, you know, in a crystalline environment, you should be able to do all kinds of new physics. But at the end of the day, it's no different than the dynamics of an electron. Right? Uh, and this remained true until the late 90s when people started to worry about topology. So from here on, I'm going to talk about the new change in our perspective that topology brought. So this picture is incomplete, and, and this was known. This was known by the very early uh, theorists, uh, Luttinger, Cohn, Roth, Blount. And then uh, there was a 30-year gap. Um, then it was picked up again by Michael Berry, who really brought topology to uh, physics uh, through what's called the Berry phase, and then picked up by Chen Niu and so on. Okay, so to, to, to understand the roots of this problem, um, let me go back to the lattice again. So this is the point where I had to bring in the vector potential, but uh, okay, let, let, let's see how it goes. Now, imagine you were a, an Uber driver or you were a passenger trying to get a, an, an Uber, right? And the, uh, in Manhattan, I should say, and the, uh, the GPS can only identify junctions. Now, of course, the rail GPS is much better, right? Even if you're in the middle of a block, it can locate you. But let's pretend that it can only identify street junctions, right? So this would be streets and the vertical lines are avenues. Uh, you, you will never find, the, the driver will never find you if, you if you're stuck in between, right? You have to walk to the nearest junction. But uh, electrons are not confined. You see, they, they, they don't spend all their time, well, they do spend most of their time uh, in, in, at the lattice site, but they often spend lots of time in between, which I call the intracell coordinate, right? So when they're in between, you have to locate them by finding the nearest junction and then locate their final position by this intracell coordinate that folks call big X. And this big X is quantum mechanical because it's identified by these quantum numbers. So whenever you encounter a new quantity, it's natural to take its derivative, see how rapidly it changes. Uh, and again, it involves the curl, which I mentioned before. Now, if we are liken X to A, the vector potential, you can imagine taking the curl of this funny intracell coordinate, and you get the Berry curvature, right? So the upshot is the following. You, you will remember that I said that when the wave functions oscillate too rapidly, right, they lie beyond the Bragg plane, they have no meaning because we, we simply cannot handle electrons that fall in, in the crack, so to speak. And the Berry curvature or Berry phase actually corrects this deficiency in our description. And until folks understood what the Berry curvature did, they, they, they sort of I ignored what happened in between, right? So the conventional picture ignores electrons in the interstitial location, intracell locations. Okay, so uh, I, I realized this is quite abstract, but this was the simplest way I could I could uh, introduce this topic. Hope hope, hope uh, uh, things are clear. Now, actually, to make a, to to delve into the history, Luttinger in 1955 uh, had uncovered this effect. He he did not call it the Berry curvature, of course. I think today we should really call this effect the Luttinger curvature. But he uncovered this in, in vigorous quantum mechanical calculations, and he was heavily criticized because of predictions that I will make, I will describe uh, in the next slide. Then he recruited Walter Cohn, who was a young postdoc, to, to, to try to figure it out, but uh, they never could convince the community that what they were saying made any sense. And Luttinger abandoned this idea. Well, he didn't. He walked away from it uh, after 
working on it for eight years. But then 30 years into the future, Michael Berry, in the context of topological physics, rediscovered this effect, which I will now talk about. Okay, so I already mentioned the real uh, space, right? This is where all the atoms live. So this is uh, uh, indicated by R. The familiar magnetic field that you apply in the lab will penetrate the real space. And as I mentioned, they will compel a charge to move in a cyclotron orbit, right? So this just repeats what I mentioned in the old picture. In the new picture, the K space, remember K space is the preferred space to describe uh, electrons. This, if you wish, is the floor map that the hotel manager looks at. It's actually pierced by the Berry curvature. So the Berry curvature uh, which was nature's way of correcting the deficiency in the description here, has this strange relationship where it acts like the magnetic field, but it lives in K space. Okay? Uh, and what Luttinger found, so here, here's the, the crux of Luttinger's finding, that if the Berry curvature exists, then when you multiply it by whatever force you apply, this could be the electric field, or in the example I will mention, it could be the wall potential of the original crystal. Uh, you take the vector product with the Berry curvature. It, it, it's amazingly similar to the cross product that gave you the Lorentz force, right, indicated here. But it, uh, it, it adds to the velocity, which, uh, oh, I show this in the next slide, right? So this is what Luttinger found. And uh, he said that, well, the, the equations that everyone loved, that, that as I mentioned was disappointing, is actually incomplete. Um, you have to add in this additional term coming from the Berry curvature. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, Luttinger tried for eight years to convince the community. Uh, the, the, the reason why folks oppose this was because the prediction of this new term wasn't observed. And then also for theoretical reasons uh, uh, that, that I won't go into. Uh, in 64, <laughs> he, he basically walked away from this problem. But now this is the, these are the equations that should appear in every textbook. Even today, all textbooks on, on condensed matter physics will use the incomplete picture. But, you know, this is not too bad, right? Because as I mentioned, this spawned the whole electronics era by leading to the invention of the transistor. So one can hope that this new correction will lead to even uh, more exciting applications. All right, so step back a little bit. Uh, now we, we are in the old age when the Berry curvature wasn't, present. So the, the way that you detect the magnetic field or the effect of the magnetic field on a current is called the Hall effect. And all of you know this, but I'll just uh, review what we do in the lab, right? So here's a crystal, a metallic crystal. If you pass a current, and let's pretend they are all positively charged, the positive charge uh, uh, Will, will flow mostly downstream, but because of the Lorentz force, they will be deflected, let's say to the right, right? So the electrons will pile up on, the, on their right edge and be deficient on the left. So if you attach a magnetic, uh, a voltmeter that compares the potentials of the two edges, you will detect a very tiny Hall signal. And Interestingly, if you reverse the magnetic field, but don't change anything else, the deflection will be to the left. And this uh, all voltage will change in sign, right? So this was dis discovered by uh, Edwin Hall. I think it's Edwin, yeah. A long time ago in, in the 1870s. Um, needless to say, if the carriers are charged neutral, 
like if there were phonons, phonons are quanta of lattice vibrations, or they were comprised of spins, as Jen mentioned. So you have a spin current. Uh, they, they don't have a charge, so there's no Lorentz force. The Hall effect should vanish, right? So the, here, here is an important fact that the new point of view that topology brought based on the Berry curvature, uh, the profound effect on these uh, predictions. So this is what I will talk about for the remaining slides. How, how am, I, am I doing for time, uh, Chimiao? How much time do I have left? Uh, let me just press on. Okay, so uh, I need to talk about the, the thermal analog of the Hall effect. Okay, because now I want to talk about insulators that do not have electrons, right? Their Fermi energy is stuck in a gap so that nothing should move when you apply a, an electric field, right? So this defines an insulator. However, if you apply a temperature gradient, right? So here, I realize the gradient by sinking with a gold uh, contact and a gold wire to a cold reservoir. We call this a bath. And then you heat up one edge, you will drive a heat current, right? And if, if the Berry curvature were present, uh, Lattinger showed that the entities that carry the heat current will be deflected to one side, let's say to their right. And this edge will become slightly warmer than the opposing edge. So if you could attach thermometers to both edges, marry, uh, measure them uh, simultaneously, you can actually detect the slight increase in temperature on the right compared to the left. So my group has specialized in this technique uh, and, and develop the technology to measure temperature differences uh, in the sub-millikelvin temperature range. So the sample is uh, at one Kelvin, say, and the difference in temperature when a heat current flows will be one millikelvin. That's a very tiny shift, but now we have the means to see it. Right? But, but this is a very surprising uh, a prediction because you're looking at a Hall effect, even though the, the carriers are charge neutral. Now, the material that I want to talk about is uh, currently of intense interest because of some predictions that Kitai have made. Uh, it's called ruthenium chloride. It's comprised of layers of honeycomb uh, lattices. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here, here's a cartoon. So the ruthenium atoms describe a honeycomb lattice exactly like graphene, right? That, that, that's, uh, the, the, this motif seems to run across many, many compounds. They form a layer uh, and, uh, okay, I, I won't describe the uh, spin axis because this takes, this is rather technical. Um, so this material was predicted to have a berry curvature. And because of the Berry curvature, uh, when you flow heat uh, in the layers, the Berry curvature will force them to be pushed to one edge, either right or left. And if you reverse the magnetic field, the Berry curvature will invert and they will have a uh, thermal Hall effect of the, of the uh, opposite sign. So uh, Peter Checker uh, undertook this very challenging experiment for his thesis, and he, he uh, nursed the experiment until he, he obtained signal to noise ratio uh, that, that, you know, that to me looks very impressive. And th th there's no, no uh, doubt that this effect exists. So let, let me explain a little bit uh, the setup for his experiment. The green bar indicates the sink or the bath, right? This is the cold sink. Uh, and the crystal is the gray rectangle. It's uh, epoxy to the bath vertically. Magnetic field points vertically. And the heater is glued to one edge. 
So when the heater is on, we drive a heat current towards the bath. Now, the yellow boxes are thermometers. These are very sensitive semiconductors that uh, in which the resistance is exponentially sensitive to the temperature. We turn on the magnetic field and turn on the heater and compare the thermometers B and C. So this is what uh, the difference of those two thermometer readings are. And you can see that the sensitivity that Peter achieved is really in the sub millikelvin regime, right? So within a millikelvin difference, he can detect the change. Uh, when the magnetic field is zero, nothing much happens. And then as you turn the field in the positive direction, let's say up in this cartoon, uh, you, you see that the difference in temperatures becomes positive and then it goes away, right? But then when you reverse the magnetic field on the left, it goes negative. And you can go back and forth and, and, and establish that indeed, you do see a Hall effect, right? Because Hall, because you're monitoring the two edges as a function of field direction. Uh, th this is direct proof that the Hall signal exists, even though this is an insulator. And Peter went crazy and mapped the Hall signal throughout the phase diagram, right? So here I'm plotting all the temperatures between one and 10 and magnetic fields going from zero to 12 Tesla. W one Tesla is roughly what your body experiences in an MRI machine. It's a very strong field. One Tesla is enough to pull keys out of your pocket unless you type them down. Um, the Refrigerator magnet, which you are familiar with, is uh, something like 1% uh, one, 1 to 5% of 1 Tesla. So going to 10 Tesla, that's a very strong field. Uh, and Peter, Peter measured 50 curves from which he could construct this color map, right? Red means the signal, the signal meaning the height of this curve is largest and Purple, let's see, where's zero? Oh, zero, zero is light blue. It's zero over here, but then it has this curious and uh, negative uh, signal uh, very close to uh, um, one Kelvin. So with this, uh, I'm not showing you all the data because of time. Oh, I, I am showing you a subset of this data. Uh, you can basically track at, at any given temperature and this gives the temperature between three Kelvin, going to four or five, and then going to nine Kelvin. As a function of magnetic field, each point here represents the difference between left and right in temperature uh, and, and, and so on, right? And then we can convert this to get what's called the Hall conductivity, uh, which I didn't quite explain. But anyway, uh, from these curves, Peter, convinced me that actually he was seeing the Barry curvature. And at the same time, uh, in this material, uh, many theoretical groups computed the Barry curvature and they confirmed that it exists. Um, here again is the Brillouin zone, right? Kx, Ky, sorry, Kx here, Ky. This is the Brillouin zone that identifies, you know, all the occupied room, so to speak, of this uh, hotel in the cave space. Blue is the Berry curvature. Blue means a negative Berry curvature. When you reverse the field, it becomes red. And, and that fit our, the predictions fit our experiments quite well. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the theory is a little bit too elaborate for me to describe here. Uh, let me just show the agreement, right? So, so Peter's data plotted versus temperature when he converted to what's called the thermal hall conductivity divided by temperature agrees with theory rather well. And the agreement is uh, not only um, persuasive, the magnitude derives something called the churn number, 
which we found to be one. And so this seems to clinch the, uh, the issue for us, that what we were seeing was basically the, um, let me go back at one slide, basically uh, chiral states, which, uh, which uh, Jen briefly described. So the, these chiral edge states are like the one-way traffic that Jen mentioned. They are running around the peripheral boundary of the crystal, but this time they are conveying spin excitations rather than electrons. There aren't any electrons in this crystal that can move. So uh, the, these spin excitations run around the periphery and they generate a hall of all effects, but translated as a temperature difference. Uh, and we believe this is the first concrete such experiment showing that bosons, right? The bosons are, 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 are a description of these uh, statistical behavior of these spin excitations. Uh, th this we believe is the first concrete evidence for boson uh, all effect. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty much at the end. Uh, I, I realize this is a somewhat technical talk. I've tried to make it as accessible as possible without equations, but I'm certainly uh, uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> Any questions for Paul? Very curvature is absolutely clear by now. What is the physical origin of this Barry's curvature? Okay, so, so this is my failed attempt to motivate the origin, right? So remember the Uber uh, conundrum. So if you have a lousy GPS, you can only tell when the passenger, the pickup is at the junction, right? This is exactly the situation in the standard picture, the, the old picture that block uh, cone and so on uh, finalized. The electrons can only be relevant or they can be described when they are at these uh, junctions, at the interstitial, at the, uh, uh, where the atoms are. But nature, of course, doesn't really care what the failings of human understanding is, right? Nature will do whatever she wants. So the electrons will spend time in between, right? And this interstitial description, which I called X, exactly describes that, right? That the interstitial coordinate tells you when the electron is deviating away from these junctions. That is the origin of Berry curvature. If you take this uh, interstitial coordinate seriously, and you take its derivative in, in, in this uh, mathematical way, you get exactly the Berry curvature. Then you step back and say, but wait a minute, this should be true for all crystals. And that's what Luttinger was trying to tell the community, gosh, 60 years ago, that, that you cannot ignore this because this, you know, nature will come back and bite you in the back if you uh, ignore this, right? Uh, fortunately for the further development of solid state theory, in most materials, yes, it exists, but when you average it over the entire Brillouin zone, it's zero, rigorously zero. So you have to have certain symmetries, and today we understand it. You, this, the material has to be topological. If it's topological, the Berry curvature does not vanish on average, and then it can give rise to all these uh, uh, unexpected effects that I mentioned. Okay, so th that's how topology comes in, which I didn't have time to tie in. Uh, let me say it now, l let, me, let me say it now. So, so again, a, a rapid answer to your question is, if you take seriously the intracell coordinate, work out its derivative, out pops the Berry curvature, but for 90% of the crystals, it will vanish when you average over the Brie 1 zone, right? For the remaining 10%, when you go to K space, 
it doesn't vanish because of something called the churn number, which, which I briefly mentioned. If you integrate the Berry curvature all over the B1 zone, remember the B1 zone uh, captures the states inside the square that I mentioned, right? If you integrate the Berry curvature over the entire uh, B1 zone for the particular band that you're in, you arrive at what's called the churn number. If the churn number is zero, that tells you that the Berry curvature, it's there, but it averages, averages to zero. So no experimental consequence. If the churn number is one, two, or three, then you have a topological material. So it's like a touchstone that tells you when a, a, a particular object, uh, par, a particular crystal is topological. So this is yet another finding from the last 10 years. Um, it's too bad that, that Luttinger had passed on because it exactly confirms what he was trying to tell us. I, 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 I hope that makes it clear. I'm not sure. Um, I, I guess, I mean, in block waves exist at every point in space uh, inside a crystal. Correct. Correct. So um, what is this interstitial coordinate? Uh, I mean, yeah, that's so exactly it's what you said. Non-zero right? so, amplitude everywhere. So, yeah, yeah. So, so, block wave is defined everywhere, right? But it's also defined on the interstitial space, right? In uh, in between, so to speak, right? It's also defined there, right? But in the standard theory, we completely ignore its value. Its value in the interstitial co uh, coordinate has no impact on experiment or observables. Okay, thank you. Yes. Please. Can you tell us in a simple form, what exactly did the name, what was he missing that the community did not understand? Well, it, what it was what that, I just you know, yeah, yeah, that little, that little hump that people did not get and that we understand now. And then the second part is because we have better technology that we're able to see things, are yeah. we going to see even more things coming out? That, that's the hope. <laughs> okay, so what, what was the key ingredient? Um, remember, uh, I mentioned that, you know, Walter Cohn and others, uh, it, it was a, an enormous, uh, achievements to arrive at, sorry, let me just scroll around, to arrive at these equations, right? Uh, which is now found in all textbooks. Uh, this was a 20 page dense quantum mechanical calculation. At the end of the day, it, it reduced to these equations. Uh, and Walter Kuhn characterized this as a shockingly complicated method. Uh, his his student, uh, Laura Roth, uh, found an easier way to do it, but nonetheless, it was still very unexpectedly complicated. Um, implied in, in these derivations is this uh, um, approximation that I mentioned, that you, you don't worry about what the wave functions are doing in between lattice sites. You are only focusing on what the electron is doing as it hops from one side to the other. So uh, that hidden assumption, when you translate from real space to k-space, let me scroll to k-space. Okay, here we go. So we now we translate that assumption to k-space that is tantamount to saying, we don't worry about stuff that happens outside this Brillouin zone. I remember I mentioned, let me show it. Yeah, here we go. I mentioned that if you cause the envelope wave function to wiggle faster and faster, right? The faster you go, the larger the K vector until you hit the Bragg plane. And then there's no further physical meaning uh, if you wiggle faster than that. It, it, you can show that 
it it uh, it it collapses back to a slow wave function. So folks threw away all information that could come from from faster wiggles. In, in the trade, this is called ignoring transitions to higher energy bands. And um, so yeah, so so the the two the two statements are equivalent. Uh, ignoring, let me scroll down again, ignoring real space, yeah, ignoring the interstitial behavior of electrons is equivalent to ignoring what the wave functions are doing outside the Brillouin zone. Now, it, the, the two spaces are the reciprocals of each other. What is small here is large here, so this is a bit confusing at first. Um, but Luttinger had found that you you cannot ignore that that there are these corrections that he even got the Berry curvature right that he couldn't name but he had the mathematical uh, expression and if you take it seriously this will give rise to a further contribution to the velocity that adds to the uh, right that adds a new term to what the entire community had accepted as the equations. And this is what was missed. Uh, now, of course, in the age of topological materials, we know where to look for it by finding the right materials. Uh, and then we can just use standard techniques to search for it. So uh, to that point, right, uh, this material was known to be topological because we had the tools, the, the theoretical tools now to identify the churn number, to, to calculate the churn number, and theorists told us, yeah, yeah, this material has a churn number of one for the lowest band. So this is a promising material to look for the, the uh, Berry curvature. And indeed, this is the experimental proof. The, the technology is not a, a quantitatively new method. It's just done much, much better with modern electronics. This could have been done when I was a graduate student, but the error bars were <laughs> humongous, right? So with modern technology and uh, clever graduate students, you can get this beautiful uh, resolution. Uh, I hope I answered the question. Any further questions? Yes, please. The Berry curvature is affected by magnetic fields and by temperature. What happens when you have them both? Uh, it, it's not affected by temperature. It, it, the main effect is by magnetic field. The magnetic field tends to align the Berry curvature, but uh, in, in a way that is sometimes surprising. So uh, here, the Berry curvature for this particular material points out of the screen. It's pointing towards you, right, perpendicular to the screen, but the magnetic field is applied parallel to the plane. So it's a bit surprising. The magnetic field is perpendicular to the Berry curvature. It has this crazy perpendicularity because of the crystal structure. Uh, temperature has no effect on it. It remains as robust uh, until the temperature gets so high that you melts the uh, solid. So temperature doesn't affect it, but temperature does affect the experimental signature, as I showed here, right? It, it's, it, 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 it blooms and then fades away as you go high above 10 Kelvin. Yeah, there's a question over there, please. Um, Craig, in the back, please. I think this follows on the, the question that was just asked, and I was wondering, so basically setting up the the heat engine almost, the, the temperature gradient, were you doing that not because it has an effect, but because you could see the change in the velocity of the electron? Is that, it's, I think it's really ingenious what Peter or whoever did set this up. So are you setting up the the cold sink, hot sink, the, the scenario that gave you that beautiful signal, um, is what you're detecting with the slightly higher temperature at the end is the difference in the velocity due to the curvature. Is that? No, no, no. Uh, 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 if I 
I mean, you're almost right. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to understand it. It's really clever, but I... <laughs> no, no, no. That's, a, that's an excellent question, actually. If, if the heater will not turn on, okay, so, uh, so you, you, you don't have any heat pouring out of the heater, the entire crystal will be at the same temperature, right? It, it would be the temperature of the sink, okay? Right. So typically that's one Kelvin. Uh, so nothing flows. I mean, there are still these excitations running around with velocity, but they all rigorously average to zero, right? Because a crystal that's in equilibrium cannot display or host a heat current, a net heat current. Now we turn the heater on and that upsets the equilibrium, right? right. So, you know, it's as if, you th th think of yourself in Grand Central and you're looking down from the top floor and you see a thousand passengers scurrying around, but there are equal numbers running up as down west and east, right? So there's no net flow of passengers anywhere, right? They're, they're all equally balanced. But now you turn on the heater and preferentially the heat will want to run to the sink, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're driving a heat current. So there will be more, the, the, the velocity will be higher going towards the sink. But it would all uh, be perpendicular with no bias between right-handed and left-handed edge, right? To the new effect, is still, you know, having most of them run vertically down, but now they are biased towards one edge, let's say B, and that causes the edge B to heat up by a, you know, several millikelvin. Then you reverse the field, they are still running down the same direction, but now they are biased to the right edge. So that, that is exactly what this signal so, is. So he was like figuring, he tried to, he figured out a way to see kind of quote the curvature um, because of what you just explained, right? By using, Correct. By using Correct. the temperature difference. Yeah. That's, that's really clever. Did, did he come out of his own or did, did you uh, all figure out? My how group, my group <laughs> have been doing this for 20 years. Oh, so, <laughs> all different. so if you, if you replace this by diamond, diamond is not thought to be topological. But, but maybe Jen will correct me. But anyway, if this were diamond, diamond is the world's best uh, conductor of heat. Uh, and you turn on the heater, you would see a huge uh, heat current running down to your sink, but it wouldn't be biased right or left. Interesting. Right? Because why would the heat conductors, the, the phonons, these are quanta of heat, why would they care if you turn on the magnetic field? And this would be true of... 80% of the of the insulating materials that you can think of, you know, pure silicon, plastic, whatever. It's, you have to be, have this material be topological, which means that its churn number is one, which in turn means that there's a very curvature just waiting to appear when you apply a magnetic, your ordinary magnetic field. And then all topological materials will exhibit this uh, temperature difference. That's really neat. Thank you. Sure. Okay, at this point, um, maybe a bit short question, is that? Go on, ask a question, please. I'll get you. With that slide, uh, I had two questions. One was a comment to make sure that I wrote my notes down correctly. You said that you had forces up to 10 Tesla? The magnetic field. Oh, net field, okay. So wrong notes. Thank you for that. Um, and we're on the bottom, I'm, I'm unfortunately a biologist, so it's squiggly to me. Um, at six, Right hand, the graph on the right hand side. Wow. Yeah. How is yeah. it possible that you have two points of two different energies? The, the blue to the left. Oh yeah, excellent question. Right. So, so, so this, points. yeah. So blue, right? Refer to this chart. B blue means negative, right? So yeah, somewhere here, zero is a teal. I guess you would call it. So this is teal, and I don't know. These colors are chosen by Peter, and I said. 
don't make it so complicated. <laughs> but graduate students do what they want. So blue means uh, uh, negative, red means positive for, for, for this difference, right? Uh, well, there's no easy way to explain this, but the uh, theoretical calculations, in fact, predicted this negative portion before we finished the experiment. So this is what convinced us that these calculations, which I show here, uh, were in fact uh, correct. They, they were performed by Kim's group in uh, Mon in Toronto, and you know published about a year before we submitted our own paper. So, so that that uh, there's no easy way to explain uh, the the blue crossing, but it, it's it's a uh, an unusual signature that was predicted by the calculation, all all based on the Berry curvature. Yeah, let, let me let me remind you of the scale again for ten Tesla field, right? If you go uh, have an MRI taken, uh, uh, hopefully never. You, the the field that you will experience is roughly one Tesla. Your your body is exposed to one Tesla field. Uh, but if you could increase the field, and and there are projects to do so now, to six Tesla, uh, your end up your MRI picture, the, the, the X-ray equivalent, will be six times higher in resolution. So there are many, many medical labs that are trying to increase the magnetic field, but the cost is exorbitant. So, you know, most machines are one or in most two Tesla. And as I mentioned, a magnetic toy uh, will be half a Tesla, when, when you buy these magnets from Amazon that are really strong, they would be like half a Tesla. Uh, a refrigerator magnet will be some 1% of one Tesla, 10 milli Tesla, right? So th these are impressive fields. Uh, when, when they are turned on in my lab, everything that can be strapped down had better be strapped down. Otherwise, <laughs> it will come flying towards the doer. All right. On that note, uh, thank you for. Okay. Good. So while Matt is setting up, I, I thought that I would just uh, make a two-sentence remark that quantum physics is always about duality. We have particles, and we have a dual, which is which are waves, uh, and then. And as matter physicists are able to push that duality to the extreme of working with the real space, working with the k-space with actual consequences that in the future will connect with the real world. Uh, because the kind of things Fawn talked about and Jen as well would have applications in the quantum technology. But that's down the road. 